Good afternoon, everyone, from a slightly sunny London today. It's always good with the better weather. Yeah, London seems nicer. Welcome to another one of these fabulous webinars from Refinitiv from wherever you are in the whole world, across Asia, Americas, or EMEA. Today, we are going to have fabulous insights around the global agriculture production outlook provided by the Refinitiv Agriculture Research Team. Um, obviously, we will discuss a number of risks, uncertainties, opportunities, and a lot more from the post-COVID scenarios and how markets are behaving around the currently uncertain times as they are across. I hope everyone is keeping safe globally. Just briefly before I do get our experts invited and start speaking on the webinar, we have been organizing a number and a series of webinars focused on the global agriculture markets under the Refinitive Agri Insights Week that we've been organizing. So we've had one focused on the palm oil fundamentals outlook. Um, obviously, it was delivered by our Asian team, so there's a greater focus on the Asian biofuel and the diesel markets and the impact of COVID-19. You can access the recording online. If you go on RefinitiveEvents.com, you'll obviously be able to find the recording and access the on-demand webinar if you need to. Today, obviously, we have the, the Global Agriculture Production Outlook, and following this on the 19th of May, we'll have something to look at the supply chain. Uh, on the 20th of May, we'll be taking a weather outlook angle in understanding how the weather is going to create an impact on the global agriculture markets. And then also on the 20th of May, there will be another one very much focused on the Black Sea region supply chain impact due to the coronavirus and the COVID-19 situations. So again, it is a fabulous opportunity for all of you to dial in a number of these different webinars, listen through to our experts, and build a better understanding of the global agriculture markets as seen by the Refinitive Agriculture Research Team. Delighted to have Dong Sun Choi today. He's going to be our speaker today. He's a senior analyst at Refinitive Agriculture Research Team. Uh, and leads the forecasting for several major grain and oil seeds crops in U.S., Canada, and Argentina. Prior to joining, uh, joining Refinitiv, uh, Dong also worked at the LG Economic Research Institute as a senior agriculture and natural resource economist in charge of the microeconomic research and market analysis. Dong earned his undergraduate degree from New York University and then completed graduate studies at the Columbia University and Penn State University as well. So Dong, delighted to have you on board today and really looking forward to your insights. But just last thing before I invite Dong to start properly, a few housekeeping bits. We would love to hear from you during this webinar and be as interactive as possible. This is obviously a listen-in only webinar, so you would be listening in via your PCs, laptops, Macs, or the machines that you're using. So please do adjust the volume, obviously, if you're working from home and do not want to disturb your kids or anyone else around you. But obviously, feel free to put in questions, comments, feedback. There is a little Q&A tab at the bottom of your screens. You will see just underneath where the presentation slides are appearing. And if you would like to ask any question, have any comment, or provide any feedback, please do put that in. At the end of the webinar, there will be a survey that you will see pop up in front of you in, 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 the, in the screens that you are looking at the webinars. Uh, we would love to hear your further feedback, response about the presentation, and also if you would like to know more about the Refinitiv Agricultural Research Services and products, then it is your chance to get in touch with us. Uh, the webinar will be recorded. The recording will be provided with you, provided to you, hopefully within a week or so, so that you have access to all the materials and the recording available, as well as there are a few bits of materials available for your liking, so that you can download and read a bit more about about our work and the research as well. So with that, Dong, over to you to get us started. Thank you, Rohan. Um, well, hello, everyone. This is Dong Sun Choi with Refinitive Ag Research. Hope everybody's doing well um, in this time of working from home. I'm doing the same here in Chicago. And luckily for me, uh, so far so good and healthy. I hope that's the case for all of you. So, well, uh, so the, for the next 45 minutes, we will be discussing the, um, the global agricultural production outlook, and it's going to be followed by 
10 to 15 minutes of Q&A session. The focus will be on our near-term projections of major grain and oilseed crops around the world. And along the way, we are going to try to identify what risk factors and uncertainties can arise so that we can be better prepared for them. So um, that will be the main theme throughout this presentation. Well, let's waste no time. Uh, we have lots to talk about today. Uh, I'd like to get right into it. Oh, I'll just, uh, just remind you very quickly, uh, this is the first one of our upcoming webinar series. We have some big ones coming up next week, uh, lots of interesting discussions. Uh, really uh, looking forward to them. Uh, but I'd like to make it clear that today we will be focusing on production side of things specifically. Um, and that's actually where our expertise is best served. Uh, you know, we've been doing this for many years uh, with passion and commitment. Our goal has never changed. Uh, our primary mission is always to provide you with timely, accurate crop production forecast. Uh, we are a group of experts. Every analyst in our team is specialized in specific crops and geographies. Um, the crops we cover include corn, soybean, wheat, rapeseed, and palm oil. Uh, for example, I cover U.S. wheat, Canada wheat and rapeseed, as well as Argentina crops. I lead the forecasting of AYP, area yield and production of those crops in those geographies. And now, um, I'd like to take this opportunity uh, to promote our new additions. Uh, we have recently added Brazil, Thailand, sugar cane, and EU, Russia, sugar beet uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, our initial AYP forecasts are now available on ICON. Uh, they will be updated every other week going forward. So um, please go ahead and check them out. Uh, here's a little a flow diagram uh, outlining our methodology uh, for forecasting production. Well, we start the early season uh, by looking at climate teleconnections like ENZO, um, and of course, uh, you know, prices and costs uh, and some historical trends as well uh, in order to do uh, area modeling. And as the season progresses, uh, we utilize satellite imagery models uh, and weather models. Sometimes we talk with industry experts. So uh, the bottom line here is that, uh, broadly speaking, uh, we take data of three different categories, economic data, weather data, and satellite imagery data. When you combine them all together using you know, various regression analysis techniques, so hundreds of variables are tested or infused into our model. So that was the uh, that was a brief introduction. Um, now I think what we want to accomplish in this presentation is essentially to find answers to these three key questions. The first one, obviously, uh, we want to talk about our numbers, estimates, and projections, um, and how those are different from the current market expectations. I would also like to walk you through uh, the recent state of the world's economy and politics and explore you know, how it's affecting the AYP dynamics. Uh, we can also briefly touch on some of the, uh, the important policy changes um, in major producing countries. And then, of course, uh, we'll discuss some potential risk factors and uncertainties uh, pertaining to the market at the moment, including the short-term and long-term uh, possible impact of the, um, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which I think many of you must be interested in. Um, first of all, let's just quickly go over the world production of corn, soy, and wheat over the past 10 years. Uh, wheat is probably the least volatile one, uh, pretty stable, even in the 2018-19 uh, the season. Uh, we will talk more about that in a few minutes. If you look at soybeans, well, it makes up the, the smallest share, uh, but has been obviously the, the least stable one. Uh, production has literally doubled since 2012, and, and there has been lots of volatility there, uh, contributing to the, uh, the overall market growth in that particular sector. Again, uh, we'll come back to this uh, very soon. Uh, 
Uh, now, why don't you start with uh, North America? Uh, we can talk about corn, soy, wheat, and rapeseed crops there. Um, and then I think we can move on to South America and Europe. Well, U.S. spring plantings are active as we speak. Um, our production estimate increase in large part attributes to a rise in planted acreage following a dismal sowing season last year, you know, uh, following a historic season that kept record acres unplanted. Our broad regional patterns are consistent in showing larger rebounds in areas that's the, the largest of uh, planted planted acres in 2019. Also, if you think about historically low wheat acreage and expected declines in uh, other major crops like cotton, um, you know, those extra acreage has to go somewhere. You know, they will only favor a healthy increase in corn and soybeans this season. Um, well, these figures are all directly from ICON. Um, as you can see, uh, corn planting is well past halfway, 67% done as of May 10th, 11% uh, ahead of the five-year average. The soybean planting is going really well, too. Uh, it actually reached the highest level for these states over the uh, last 10 years. Uh, the dark red color here uh, is this season, and lighter color is last season. And the five or averages are, are represented by these uh, dotted lines. I mean, obviously, uh, it's still early in the season, um, and of course, uh, you know, spring weather is always critical. Uh, the market is watching the forecast closely. Uh, it's been it's been pretty cold the uh, last few days. Uh, but overall, so far so good. Uh, weather has been largely cooperative. Our current estimates put U.S. corn production at 15.4 billion bushels, uh, soybean production at 4.1 billion bushels. Uh, but if summer weather cooperates, uh, we may see even higher numbers. Well, the same cannot be said for spring wheat. Um, Spring wheat plantings are significantly behind schedule. Uh, as you can see from the screen, um, you know, um, a combination of below average temperatures, above normal soil moisture levels, um, and some remaining harvest of last year's corn crop may have slowed down uh, the spring wheat planting efforts. But the situation has gotten a lot better lately. Uh, plantings have picked up pretty well, uh, especially over the last couple of weeks. Uh, they are still a whopping 21% behind the fiber averages, though. Um, and if this pace continues, it will affect yield. Um, you know, delayed plantings typically impact a series of critical yield-determining processes. Uh, probably the most critical is the shortening of the growth cycle. I mean, obviously, uh, it's, it's not that simple. You know, uh, uh, the relationship between planting pace and final yield is, is fairly complicated. For example, late planting does not necessarily equate to dismal yield, just as early planting does not guarantee high yield. Uh, the weather in the growing season is also important, obviously. Uh, but, you know, when you have some extreme delays, uh, you better pay attention to it. Uh, planting pace can be a, a critical yield determining factor. Um, well, there's no question about that. Um, we are at 15.9 million tons for total spring wheat, um, and that's based on area of 13.4 uh, million acres, 1.2 for germ and 12.2 for other spring wheat. Now, uh, let's take a look at uh, winter wheat. Um, it just ran through some uh, spring freeze events in mid-April especially uh, most of the Kansas crop uh, was exposed to air temperatures below 24 degrees, uh, which is the, uh, the spring injury threshold for wheat at least a couple of times during that time. Uh, that's probably the biggest event uh, that has happened uh, to the, uh, the U.S. Uh, winter wheat crop this season by far. And, of course, that means lower condition scores. Um, you can see the, uh, the huge drop here, uh, reflecting the damage from the, the freeze event. Uh, the percentage of the crop uh, that's in good or excellent condition dropped significantly uh, late April and early May uh, because of that. 
And most of it attributes to the cost for the Kansas crop because Kansas accounts for such a high share of total winter wheat production. But uh, having said that, um, you know, uh, wheat is a very resilient crop. Um, for example, if you can remember, just two years ago, I believe it was 2018-19 season, uh, winter wheat went through a lot uh, during dormancy, you know, um, extreme drought in the south, um, you know, a number of winter kill events in the north. Um, you can check the, uh, the, green, the green curves here. Uh, the green color represents 2018-19 season, uh, winter wheat crop conditions. They almost look like outliers now, you know, reflecting terrible crop conditions at the time. Um, a lot of people expected yield to go down significantly. Well, it turned out the final yield actually turned out to be not too bad. You know, it didn't end up being that far off the trend, um, 48 bushels per acre. It was pretty low, uh, but nowhere near what most people predicted uh, earlier in the season. Well, this season, winter wheat is doing considerably better uh, than the 2018-19 crop. Uh, uh, yes, it just went through, you know, the, the spring injury, but I don't think it has had that much impact on the, uh, the yield potential. Also, um, we need to take into account the fact that uh, soft red wheat conditions are really good right now, um, as well as uh, hard red wheat conditions uh, in some of the other uh, major producing states like Oklahoma and Texas. Our current estimate puts national level winter wheat yield at 51.3 bushels per acre, uh, still above trend. Um, I don't think we'll see any dramatic change in numbers unless uh, something extreme happens uh, during the rest of the season. Uh, it seems unlikely at the moment. Uh, this is uh, just to show you where we are in terms of U.S. corn, soy, and wheat area in yield. Um, our corn estimate put U.S. corn and soy uh, planted area at 95.7 and 82.9 million acres, respectively, up 7% and 8% from last season. Um, like I said earlier, uh, uh, we are looking at a significant acreage recovery after record-breaking uh, preventative plantings last year as well as, of course, a return to the, uh, the expected baseline yields, uh, uh, which are currently estimated at 173.8 and 50.4 bushels per acre, respectively. As for wheat, uh, we have total wheat area at 45.1 million acres, um, and that's based on 31.6 million acres of winter wheat and 13.4 million acres of uh, spring wheat. Uh, both winter wheat and spring wheat yields are down from last season, uh, according to our analysis, but still remain uh, near trend. Um, I would like to very briefly touch on Canada. Um, Stackhands numbers were finally released last Thursday after weeks of delay. Uh, they passed wheat and rapeseed planted area at 25.4 and 20.6 million acres, up 3.3% and down 1.6% from last season, respectively. Uh, they said high wheat number is mostly due to uh, higher uh, germ wheat prices. But just to remind you, uh, USDA passed Canada wheat production at 34 million tons uh, a couple of days ago um, in the WASD report, 5% higher than last season. Well. I'm not so sure about that. You know, I thought those numbers were a little too high. Um, the, the reason being that, um, first of all, it's been very dry throughout, uh, you know, pretty much everywhere in southwestern Canada. And farmers know it's going to be a dry season again, um, not to mention, you know, uh, completing harvest from the, uh, the 2019 crop uh, remains a priority for many farmers, especially in Manitoba. Um, you know, it was really it was really cold and snowy last winter. On top of that, uh, many Canadian farmers are reported to be facing enormous economic pressure. Um, Canada's whole economy might be at risk right now. Um, labor shortage, uncertain uh, demand prospects, and constant tax increases are discouraging farmers from proceeding with farming operations. Uh, so the situation is not very good in Canada. Um, we are working around numbers right now. Uh, they will be uh, uh, ready uh, very soon. 
Now, um, take a look at the uh, let's take a look at the, the weather moving forward. Um, so the left side we have forecasted temperature anomalies. Um, the blue represents below average temperatures, and the red represents above average temperatures. Well, as you can see, uh, not much concern there. Um, you know, widespread warmth across the U.S. corn and soy belt and, and, and Canadian prairies, but nothing really extreme. Uh, it's not uh, it's not likely to be uh, significant. On the right hand side, we have forecasted precipitation anomalies. Uh, the brown represents below average precipitation, and the green represents uh, above average precipitation. Uh, most of corn and soy areas in the U.S. will likely see some precipitation. Um, which should be rather beneficial during the prime growing season. Uh, but look at, the, uh, look at the U.S. spring wheat and Canada wheat and rapeseed areas in the north. It's going to be warm and dry. Um, you know, the weather conditions uh, during June to August will not be favorable for the, uh, the U.S. spring wheat and Canadian crops. Uh, they should definitely be um, uh, one item to watch. Um, our September to November annual outlook uh, came out last week. Uh, mostly harvest season, not much concern there as far as U.S. corn and soy. Uh, but harvest conditions uh, may not be so favorable for other crops. Um, you can tell uh, by looking at the, uh, the precipitation patterns. Again, uh, uh, most of the Canadian crops um, and U.S. spring wheat crops could be at risk of unfavorable, uh, unfavorable harvest conditions. Uh, but it's still far away. Uh, uh, you know, we don't have to wait and see how the how the weather is going to play. Uh, now let's go over uh, some of the uh, the risk factors and uncertainties for the uh, the North American crops. The first thing that comes to mind is, of course, uh, the continued worsening of the world economy because of the uh, the global shutdown. It's definitely putting a downward pressure on the uh, the profitability for uh, most crops. As you may well know, uh, prices are still disappointing, uh, despite recent rallies, reflecting the, uh, the uncertainty in just how much more the COVID-19 pandemic will continue to depress global markets. In addition to that, uh, expectations for healthy crops in South America, uh, coupled with lower demand potential, fueled by the resurgence of the, uh, the U.S.-China trade war, are also contributing to the, uh, the soybean complex. In the case of corn, uh, U.S. ethanol demand has been decreasing, uh, which is definitely uh, playing a role in the declining corn prices. I mean, the ongoing oil war, you know, um, oil prices have been extremely volatile lately. Um, so, yeah, uh, those are some of the things uh, that can still influence uh, farmers' decisions. Other than that, um, as we discussed earlier, uh, Canadian farmers are, are in a difficult situation financially. Uh, with the planting season on the horizon, um, the weather is not gonna is not gonna help either. Uh, the conditions during the prime growing season may not be so favorable. Not to mention the delays in the uh, the planting, um, which is actually more severe in the U.S. right now for uh, for spring wheat. Well, I think uh, we are now ready to move over to South America. Um, it's mostly harvest season right now, uh, maybe except for a few crops, uh, but there are some interesting developments down there. Um, we'll talk about Brazil first and then go to Argentina. What's happening in Brazil? Well, it looks like uh, we'll have another uh, season of huge crops um, coming out of Brazil. Uh, the soybean crop is now harvested. Uh, this season will again bring a Brazilian soybean production to a record 123.1 million tons after farmers planted uh, the, the largest crop in history, uh, just shy of 40 million hectares. Um, the biggest issue this season was, of course, uh, the persistent dryness uh, that lingered for months, um, especially in Rio Grande do Sul, uh, one of the top uh, producing states in the country. And that ended up lowering yields there nearly 33% year on year. Uh, but other than that, uh, all other major crop regions uh, did just fine. Um, you know, Brazil continues to be the most important uh, soybean producer in the world. Um, 
it's been obviously benefited from uh, the U.S. export losses to China. Uh, that's for sure. You know, Brazil remains to be China's largest uh, soybean supplier. If you look at corn, well, we have first crop corn area yields, uh, uh, area yields near last season at 4.14 uh, million hectares and 6.1 tons per hectare, respectively. Production in Rio Grande do Sul uh, suffered uh, pretty notably, though. Um, the dryness there was detrimental during the, uh, the prime growing season. And that lowered yield there 32% year on year. The second crop corn has been doing a lot better, on the other hand. Um, as you may all know, uh, there were some uh, initial concerns for late plantings early in the season uh, because of the, uh, the delayed soybean planting campaign. Uh, but weather has been largely favorable since then. Um, soil moisture has recovered quickly in most areas of Mato Grosso and Goiás. Uh, uh, thanks to the, uh, the early rains, and that's helping the crop progression a great deal. The corn crops there are on track for healthy yields. One item to watch is, of course, the lingering dryness uh, in some uh, other key regions, uh, including uh, Paraná and Mato Grosso do Sul. Um, it's been really dry there. Uh, soil moisture levels have been hovering around five-year lows uh, pretty much all season. Uh, so that should be uh, something to watch moving forward. I'd like to quickly go over Brazil sugar cane. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, starting this season, our team will begin forecasting Brazilian sugar cane AYP. Um, we'll do biweekly forecast over the next few weeks uh, based on the Crossroads Association and Ministry of Agriculture data. Well, um, first of all, our initial models are telling us that uh, harvested area estimates will likely be near 8.5 million acres, with yields slightly uh, below last season's 75.7 .7 tons per hectare, and TRS, uh, total uh, recoverable uh, uh, sugars, uh, down roughly three points to 136 kilograms per ton. Um, our recent dryness has facilitated real record vapor caution. Uh, it actually exceeded uh, uh, last season's uh, April totals by over 60%, by the way. Nearly 40% of that has gone to sugar production so far, um, given the, uh, the dramatic, uh, dramatically low uh, ethanol prices. So, um, yeah, we expect the dryness to promote uh, a rapid harvest. Uh, but at the same time, of course, uh, they might also mean negative effects on yield potential so, yeah, uh, that could be uh, something worth paying attention to. What about Argentina? Um, well, both corn and soybean harvest are going very well, uh, despite the torrential rains uh, that fell over uh, uh, some of the major crop areas of the Pantas uh, during the last week of April. If you look at the, the latest numbers from the, um, the Ministry of Agriculture and both the Buenos Aires, corn is about 40% complete so far. So it is around 75% already uh, at the national level, both ahead of the five-year averages. If anything, I would say those heavy rains late April uh, rather helped recharge soil moisture storage there. Uh, which is going to be important for the for the wheat crop. You know, um, Argentina wheat planting normally begins in late May, early June, um, and thanks to those abundant rainfall in April, soil moisture conditions in uh, in key wheat producing areas are now close to optimal. Um, you can see the uh, uh, you can see a huge improvement in soil moisture in April, uh, especially uh, in Buenos Aires. Uh, which accounts for uh, uh, nearly 40% of total wheat production. And it's been dry since then, um, you know, as if uh, things couldn't get any better. Uh, now the favorable dry weather will likely continue, at least for the short term, um, which should help immensely the, the planting activities there. Um, so everything is happening in a, in a timely manner in Argentina uh, as far as weather. Now, uh, we have to at least uh, touch on the, uh, the recent political shift uh, that took place in Argentina. 
I know the corn and soybean season is almost over, uh, but this is something that's going to affect uh, farmers' decisions uh, for many more years to come. Um, to, make, uh, to make the long story short, as you may all know, Argentina government is now led by a new president, uh, but people have been paying more attention to the, uh, the new vice president uh, because during her presidency, uh, duties on agricultural commodity exports were among the highest in history. You know, obviously, uh, this is a difficult time for Argentina. It needs to find a way to raise money, um, and uh, it will likely be through tax increases, uh, especially in the, uh, the ag sector. Uh, first of all, I'd like to make it clear that uh, these export tax rates are approximate and variable. Uh, they depend on the, uh, the constantly changing exchange rates and other variables. Meaning, you know, uh, there's sometimes this, you know, baseline tax plus like five pesos for each dollar, for example. So, so these numbers may not be so accurate, uh, but should be good enough to kind of, you know, uh, give you a sense of when they were high and when they were low under whose administration. And you can tell uh, taxes are just not likely to go down um, under the current government, uh, to say the least. Two thirds of Argentine farmers think the government will hike export taxes. Well, it has happened already, uh, and it's likely to happen again. Uh, it's 33 percent now uh, for soy, uh, from 30 percent from the um, uh, and from the, uh, the previous 25 percent. So farmers are changing up their investment plans, um, and this was before the season even started last year. Um, if you compare this with uh, the historical trend of agricultural production, uh, they, there, there tends to be a negative uh, relationship there. Obviously, under the current government, uh, there will likely be a little incentive for farmers to expand acreage. Uh, now, uh, let's take a look at uh, the forecasted weather uh, during June to August. Argentina's weather will likely be very stable, uh, especially across those poor wheat producing regions in the Pampas. Uh, it should be favorable for the wheat planting, uh, as we discussed earlier. On the other hand, and Brazil is expected to see persistent dry weather. Um, again, uh, that could hurt uh, sugarcane yield potential. Uh, but at the same time, it should help boost the TRS levels uh, and facilitate early harvest. Um, if you look at the, uh, the September to November weather outlook, um, one item to watch is the dryness in Argentina at this time. Uh, we are looking at the, uh, the prime corn and soy printing season here. Um, depending, on the, uh, depending on the soil moisture levels, then, uh, this dryness could be problematic, uh, especially for those uh, three major prov uh, producing provinces, Buenos Aires, Cordoba, and Santa Fe. So that will be uh, my take on this long-term outlook. Now, uh, what are some of the, uh, the risk factors and uncertainties for the South American crops? A lingering dryness in key system crop corn areas. Uh, we've talked about this. Uh, if dryness continues, it will likely hurt sugarcane yields as well. Um, if you can talk a little bit more about Argentina's situation, uh, 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 you know, farmers there keep facing difficult financial choices. Uh, you know, uh, when national economic uh, conditions are not healthy, it's never good for farmers. Uh, and especially for Argentina, it's a combination of a lot of things. Interest rates are still high. It's still difficult to borrow money from the bank. Argentina peso is historically weak meaning it would cost more to purchase agricultural inputs like fertilizers and pesticides because they are all priced in dollars. Inflation is always uh, unstable oil prices. And then uh, uh, there's this an additional tax burden. Uh, it will likely affect the future planting decisions uh, because it could drive down farm investment and result in smaller harvest moving forward. Um, very well. Um, switching gears, uh, let's go to Europe now. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have a separate presentation for, uh, for this region next week. Uh, more details will be provided on production and market drivers in the, in the Black Sea webinar. 
uh, next Wednesday. So uh, please keep that in mind. Um, why don't we start with the past weather in Europe? Um, overall, uh, planting season for winter crops in last fall uh, went pretty well. Uh, but some of the, uh, the key regions in northwestern Europe uh, received very heavy rainfall uh, during the prime uh, planting period, especially UK, uh, as you can see from the, uh, the second figure here. Um, it caused some really bad flooding there. Um, and remember, our wheat prices were pretty low at the time, too. In fact, at one point, wheat prices were the lowest since 2016 uh, for the time of year. So um, the combination of excessive moisture and low prices kind of kept uh, farmers from actively planting, uh, gave them little incentive to do so. Um, the acreage reduction for soft wheat was pretty big in particular. Um, got reduced by nearly a, a million hectare, uh, UK alone, so 400,000 hectare reduction in soft wheat area. Uh, it's going to affect yield potential too. Um, but as far as winter weather, um, it was largely favorable, uh, very warm winter, uh, especially in uh, continental Europe and Scandinavia with four to five degrees above normal. Uh, virtually no snow coverage, but no winter care events occurred anywhere in Europe. Um, winter crops were kept in good condition. Uh, there were some dry spots, though. Um, Central Europe and uh, the Balkans and some areas of Southern Europe are still showing low soil moisture levels, although um, they are definitely better than last year. Uh, for example, if you can remember, Germany suffered from a historic drought around this time last year. Germany's soil moisture is still, uh, you know, it's pretty, uh, pretty low uh, this season too, uh, but not nearly as low as last year. Well, obviously, a uh, dry weather could be good uh, for spring plantings. Um, also, if you think about uh, relatively decent corn prices, uh, farmers may have more incentive to expand corn area this season, uh, despite uncertain uh, market development uh, and, of course, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Oh, well, speaking of COVID-19, uh, you would say there's really no evidence of any major impact on sowing of spring and summer crops uh, due to the, uh, the coronavirus outbreak. We don't think it's impacting much, um, although uh, if there's one thing, maybe uh, labor availability is emerging as a key concern. Uh, but other than that, um, yeah, uh, no other major issues there. Uh, now, moving forward, uh, most of Europe is likely to remain warm, at least through early next month. Uh, we should benefit winter crops drying out and promote harvest campaigns. It's likely to be dry in northwestern Europe as well. So warm and dry conditions, uh, especially across the UK, uh, will be beneficial, helping get rid of any remaining excessive wetness. Central Europe could finally see some meaningful above-average precipitation. And that should help recharge soil moisture storage there. Um, so, yeah, uh, overall, uh, June weather looks to be favorable for the, uh, the European crops. Now, uh, the only exception could be uh, uh, the areas near the Black Sea region, especially Romania and Bulgaria. As you can see here, uh, uh, they're going to remain dry, uh, which might imply, you know, lower yield potential for the local spring crops there. Uh, so that's, uh, that's one thing to watch. Let's talk about uh, Eurasia's past weather now. Um, winter crop snowing went pretty well. Um, again, thanks to the, uh, the warm weather, uh, it was actually one of the warmest winters on record in Ukraine. But cold conditions did occur during uh, mid-March, especially in northern, uh, northern Ukraine. It ended up causing some frost damage uh, to the winter wheat and raised crops there, and that lowered our yield numbers too. As far as precipitation, obviously uh, persistent dryness has been an issue, uh, especially in Ukraine and southwestern Russia. Uh, but really, uh, most of the, uh, the Black Sea regions suffered from the lack of moisture up to 100 millimeters below normal in March. Um, you know, below average precipitation since the beginning of spring 
must have induced a negative yield impact on winter crops. But the dry measure so far has been rather beneficial uh, for the corn and spring wheat planting. Uh, farmers are likely to expand uh, spring crop area uh, despite the, uh, the COVID-19 effect. As for winter wheat area, um, not much change in uh, Ukraine, but Russia's winter wheat area is likely to expand uh, thanks to the, uh, the Russia's national strategy uh, to boost uh, crop production until 2030. Um, if you look at the forecast, uh, just like Europe, uh, the Black Sea region is largely expected to remain warm. So again, uh, it should benefit winter crops drying out and early harvesting. But on the other hand, it might increase dryness stress. You know, obviously, uh, a lot of crop regions there uh, have suffered from the lingering dryness. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Ukraine and southwestern Russia should finally see some moderate above normal precipitation, uh, as you can see from the screen. Uh, the thing is that it might not be nearly enough, uh, and more importantly, a little too late to save winter wheat yield. Let's talk about our numbers now. Um, our current estimate put EU wheat production at 143.5 million tons. Uh, it's down from last season, mainly due to a lower soft wheat uh, planted area, especially in uh, northwestern Europe, uh, as we discussed earlier. Soft wheat yield and durum wheat yield are both below last season. We've slightly increased Ukraine wheat production lately uh, for better rainfall prospects, uh, but, but it's still down uh, from last season, obviously, because of lower yield. Russia is up uh, thanks to the, uh, the higher yields and uh, larger area. Our rested numbers are all slightly down uh, compared to last season. As for corn, well, we think EU corn will benefit greatly from the, uh, the upcoming rainfall and warm temperatures, especially in southern and central key production regions. Of course, the impacts of COVID-19 uh, remain to be seen, uh, but really, farmers' decision to plant was probably made prior to the pandemic expansion. It shouldn't affect too much at this point. Ukraine corn production is expected to be stable, uh, not much concern there. Now, um, we just started EU and Russia sugar beet analysis, um, and these are our initial results. Uh, uh, pretty stable uh, EU production thanks to the, uh, the higher yield, uh, despite lower area uh, compared to the past few seasons. Some big number for uh, Russia, uh, uh, most of it attributes to a larger area. Risk factors and uncertainties, uh, mostly weather related. Uh, excessive redness in Northwestern Europe uh, lingering dryness in uh, Central Europe, uh, as well as Ukraine and Southern Russia. Well, again, uh, I'd like to remind you of the, uh, the upcoming webinar next week. Uh, please check out the, uh, the Black Sea webinar scheduled for uh, next Wednesday if you want more detailed outlook. Now, um, let's go over some major palm oil production regions. Uh, and then move on to China, India, and Australia. Well, Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, and Thailand account for nearly 90% of the world total palm oil production. As you can see here, uh, it's expected to decline 5 to 10% year on year in these countries, mainly because of dryness, uh, lower fertilizer usage, floods, and uh, movement restrictions. So clearly, uh, the COVID-19 impacts are there. Uh, uh, Malaysia has, re has, excuse me, has recently decided to further expand the unprecedented movement control order. Um, it's been in effect since March. The obvious consequence is, of course, uh, the labor shortage and various restrictions uh, in logistics. Plantations, palm oil mills with the cases remain closed. But in Indonesia and Thailand, uh, the impacts seem to be limited. Operations remain stable there. Uh, you know, there are no plans to halt operations in Indonesia and Thailand, 
at least not yet. Um, so the situation is a bit better there. Now, um, what about the weather? Well, it has not been helping. Um, you know, weak palm oil production this season can be linked to unfavorable conditions last year. As you can see from the screen, um, all of these countries experienced dryness last year. Um, in Malaysia and Thailand in particular, uh, the dryness persisted through the first quarter of this year, and it's likely to increase uh, the downside risks uh, for the crop output because there's always this potential lag impact on yield. But in Indonesia, the situation is a bit better. Uh, it's pretty wet in Indonesia right now. Uh, it should be favorable for palm growth. One item to watch, though, is the, uh, the localized thunderstorm uh, that can trigger floods in portions of low-lying areas, uh, and it may disrupt harvest progress and logistics. So that's one thing to watch. Um, severe dryness and lower fertilizer usage in 2019 are taking their toll on 2019-20 production. A Malaysia production total so far has declined 90% uh, versus the same time last year. Uh, Indonesia and Thailand production numbers have declined 4% and 39% respectively from last season. But, you know, uh, despite movement restrictions, uh, the production numbers are expected to improve at least gradually. And that's thanks to the, uh, the seasonal upward trend uh, in crop output uh, through the next quarters. Again, uh, we just started Thailand sugarcane production analysis. Well, Thailand has 58 sugar mills. Uh, the mills can crush more than 130 million tons of sugarcane annually, producing roughly 14 million tons of uh, centrifugal sugar our initial estimate puts 2020-21 production at 30, uh, uh, pardon me, 83 million tons, above last season's 74.9. Uh, that was a 10-year low, by the way, down 43% from the year before. Uh, that's some pretty impressive volatility, I have to say. Let's move over to China. Uh, the chart on the left shows China corn prices uh, in the Northeast uh, since 2016. Well, first of all, China corn planted area is expected to increase for the first time since 2016. As you can see from the, from the chart, uh, corn, corn prices are 10 to 15 percent higher than the same time last year, actually at the highest level since 2016. Also, uh, policy changes are playing a role, too. Uh, the Minister of Agriculture has been trying to reduce a corn area over the past few years, but this season is targeting higher area numbers uh, through the, uh, the government subsidies. So, yeah, basically high prices and favorable policy changes are driving up the corn, corn acreage. As far as weather, well, uh, the figure on the right side is the soil moisture deviation in April. Uh, the circled areas are the two major corn production regions uh, where soil moisture is currently above normal. Obviously, that means high yield potential. Our models are telling us that assuming uh, near average weather moving forward, China should produce a record corn at 264 million tons. Uh, what about India? Uh, the top left figure uh, is a, a vegetation density chart of Uttar Pradesh, uh, the largest wheat producing state in India. You can clearly see the record high vegetation density from satellite imagery indicating excellent crop conditions. Um, so, yeah, India wheat production is likely to hit a record high this season, mainly due to the above normal monsoon last summer a favorably cool temperatures in spring, and largely dry conditions during harvest. Um, there were some uh, uh, production losses in places like uh, Haryana and Punjab uh, because of the, uh, the unseasonal heavy rain and hailstones in March. But still, uh, total production is estimated at 108 million tons, above last year's record. 
the figure on the right side shows uh, the forecasted monsoon precipitation anomalies for this summer. We would say uh, uh, a near normal monsoon season is the, uh, the most likely uh, outcome uh, during June to September. Um, you know, this season uh, may get off to a, a, a slow start, but should pick up fast later with uh, increasingly favorable conditions for the wheat crop uh, as the season progresses. Lastly, uh, let's take a look at Australia. Um, our corn estimates put Australia wheat at 23.4 million tons and rapeseed at 3 million tons. And that's a whopping 55% and 35% up from last season, uh, respectively. And this makes sense if you think about what happened over the past three years. You know, Australia has suffered from uh, some of the worst drought conditions in recent history for three consecutive seasons resulting in a 13-year low production numbers just last year. Well, this season looks to be different. Um, I know it's been rather dry lately, uh, especially in uh, South Australia and Western Australia. But overall, soil moisture is still pretty healthy, and more rains are on the way, too. Um, as you can see from the screen, uh, the top three figures from left to right uh, shows uh, I show uh, the expected precipitation patterns uh, for June, uh, July, and August, uh, respectively. So overall, the situation is uh, the prospects are a lot better uh, this season. Uh, a huge rebound is expected. Um, these are some of the uh, the risks uh, and uncertainties for the countries we just uh, we just went over. Um, if you look at Malaysia palm oil production, clearly. Uh, the COVID-19 impacts are there. Lingering dryness is also uh, one item to watch. Now, uh, the fall armyworm is once again spreading across the, the southern China. And this time, the outbreak is a couple of months earlier than last year. Obviously, the past could affect some of the major corn production regions, including uh, the North China Plain and even the North uh, Eastern China. Um, the past damages could be more severe this year than last year if the government fails to contain it. So that's definitely uh, one item to watch. And that's pretty much uh, all we've got for today. Um, I guess uh, we can now officially move on to the, uh, the Q&A session. Um, Pepe, can you, can you take over? Uh, yes, uh, can you hear me, Dong? Yeah, I can hear you very well. Brilliant, great. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, my name is Jose Clavijo, and I am one of the analysts of the Agricultural Research Team, and I'll be uh, moderating the Q&A. Um, first, just a, just a quick note. Uh, we, if we don't have time to get to your question, uh, we'll do our best to, um, to get one of our team members to reach out um, with an answer um, afterwards. Um, the presentation will be recorded and you will get an email notification when it's ready to view. So if you missed any of this, um, you'll be able to download it later. All right. Uh, okay, so let's get started with the questions. Okay, we've got a few on deck and um, it seems like there's uh, quite a bit of interest on Black Sea conditions that have been uh, quite volatile recently. So I'm gonna ask, her Black Sea analyst, Aaron Grau, to answer this first one. Aaron, um, how does the recent uh, increased rainfall impact crops in the Black Sea? Yeah, um, hello everyone. Joining in, and Dong, thank you for presenting. Um, can you hear me just to make sure quickly? Okay, yeah, we can, can hear, hear you. Yeah. yeah, okay. So. Um, yeah, well, uh, prior to the recent uh, drain force, uh, the Black Sea region has been very dry, um, causing soil moisture levels in the Black Sea region to drop to 100 millimeters uh, below normal in April. So this uh, start of growing season was very hampered by the dryness. But recently in Ukraine, in particular in the northern parts in the central district of Russia, um, rainfall has been elevated 
quite much. And it came in a time uh, very timely. So uh, winter grains like winter wheat or rapeseed in these regions still will benefit from this during um, now as they move into grain fill. So that gives hope for the yields. But unfortunately, a lot of damage has been already done. So um, I think the Ukraine ministry just released uh, some data on uh, the area lost to dryness a couple of days back. And a very important crop-producing region, Odessa in Ukraine, has already lost uh, over 100,000 hectares. So they will not be harvested. That's approximately with the local years about uh, 0.4 to 0.5 million metric tons. So there is damage and we will not reach uh, last year's level. And in Russia in particular, uh, Krasnodar Krai, one of the main producers of wheat, um, unfortunately has not seen or has seen hardly any rainfall, kind of surpassed that region. And there and in Staropol, we will expect really, really big damages to a winter crops. So we, we have, in our recent updates, we have uh, moved up Ukraine wheat, but Russian wheat moved down due to that uh, circumstances. And um, furthermore, now turning to spring wheats, they will definitely um, benefit from this. Uh, so a moisture level will be uh, remoistured or recharged. And um, it's in sp- especially important, as our weather team is going to bring out an outlook soon, it looks like we will see a very dry and hot summer in the Black Sea region. So the corn crop and spring wheats planted now need the soil moisture and that might help avoiding some of the upcoming drought effects, which we expect. Yeah, um, that's all from me. Great. So I'm sure um, um, you're uh, pretty happy with the latest WASI numbers out of Russia, putting the crop at around 77 million, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, we are now at 77.7. I think uh, in the next update, we will go slightly below 77. That's what the models tell us right now, but it's a couple of days to go. But we are, we are pretty much in line. Gotcha. Great. Uh, thanks, Aaron. Okay, we've got another one, uh, this time on palm oil. So I'll uh, let our uh, palm oil analyst uh, in Singapore, KP, take this one. Thanks for staying up late, KP. Um, can you give us a bit more flavor on the 2020-21 palm oil uh, production outlook? And um, okay. in particular, the, if there's anything anything to watch there? Uh, okay. Uh, thanks, KP. So for initial 2020-21, Malaysia palm oil production is estimated at around 20 million tons. For Indonesia, it's estimated at 46 million tons. Well, for Thailand, it's estimated at 3.1 million tons. So uh, generally, the palm oil production is expected to up next year, mainly due to three reasons. Firstly, improved rainfall pattern. So, in fact, the palm oil years have very much to do with the weather. So, um, this year we have seen more regular or wet weather, especially in Indonesia. So, the rainfall surpluses are favorable for palm roof there. And secondly, the palm oil production would experience a cyclical rebound as palm oil plantations are recovering from the impact of the previous unfavorable weather. And um, lastly, an increase in the harvested area, especially in Indonesia. So the Indonesia the palm oil area rose significantly from about 14.7 million hectares to 16.4 million hectares. So uh, there's a sizable increase in the hectares. We will likely generate more crop outputs in the coming season. Yeah, so yeah, that's, that's all for me. Thank you. Got it. Uh, Brilliant. Thanks, KP. Um, Let me see here real quick. Okay. Um, Another another one that tends to get a lot of interest. Um, Conditions uh, in India with the upcoming monsoon. Uh, So, Lee Bin, um, based on this question, can you elaborate a bit more on the what what we're expecting to be the impacts of uh, the the India monsoon on crop production in the region?
Hey, Liebet, can you hear me? I think we might have lost uh, Lee Bin there for a moment. Um, I see. Let's uh, let's just wait to get her on back in a second. I will jump to um, to the next question. Uh, okay, we got one here on the U.S. Um, what are the um, what are the impacts on acreage and potential yields of the recent frost freeze event that we had in the U.S. in portions of the Midwest and Northern Plains. Um, that's a good one. So um, it, it's uh, at this point, the big picture is we're not expecting any major national level shifts in acreage uh, between crops or uh, significant hit on yields. Um, the areas impacted, as I said before, covered important portions of um, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, parts of Iowa, um, and portions of the Dakotas as well. Um, where even though plantings have been going quite fast, emergence hasn't, hadn't been particularly high for corn or soybeans in those areas. So um, we really aren't expecting massive die-offs or significant areas that will have to be replanted. I think um, from that event and continuing um, high rainfall, the one to look out for is North Dakota. I think that is a state that every year has usually the largest shifts uh, between corn and soy year on year. Um, so it's always one that's a bit tricky. Um, and so, um, um, so, so I think there could be some shifts in acreage. There will likely be fewer corn acres than what we're expecting currently. Um, so maybe closer to three or maybe slightly below three and perhaps a bit more soy in that area. Um, that could be actually offset by um, a bit more corn acreage in other portions of the Midwest um, that uh, we might get because, again, uh, sowing conditions in the rest of the country have been so good that that tends to incentivize slightly higher corn plantings. So, uh, again, at this point, no massive changes, but um, but um, definitely some potential for rearrangements on, on acreage within the states that we've talked about. Uh, okay, let's see. I think now we have Lee Bin back on the line. Lee Bin, can you hear us? Hmm, I think we're still having problems uh, connecting with um, with Lee Bin, unfortunately. Um, that's all right. I think we have another another question here for North America. Um, and I guess I'll pass this one to Dong. Dong, um, can you tell us more about Canada and how Canada's economic situation is affecting the crop outlooks right now? Sure. Um, yeah, we can we can tell us a little bit more about Canada. Well, Canada has been in a has been in a mess right now. You know, some people are even saying Canada might be at risk for default. You know, uh, all these you know microeconomic issues like increasing government debt uh, and rising household bankruptcy rates were pretty serious even before this COVID-19 outbreak. It just made it worse. Um, and now, uh, oil and gas industry is struggling too, uh, which, by the way, accounts for more than 10% of Canada's total GDP. Um, you know, many Canadian farmers simply do not have enough workers to, to get planting started. And even if they manage to do that, uh, you know, harvesting and processing will be difficult without sufficient labor. Um, there has been some talk going on about the, uh, the increasing taxes too. Uh, carbon taxes, for example, uh, that, that's going to hurt uh, a lot of people who are already struggling with their financial health. Again, uh, you know, we are, we are working on our outlook. Uh, we'll have our numbers ready very soon. Uh, what I can tell you that, you know, the situation is not great. Uh, the prospects are not, not very optimistic. Gotcha. Thanks, Dong. Um, we got another audience question here. Why are rapeseed prices quite supportive while palm oil prices continue to decline? Um, KP, do you want to take this one? Um, sure. So uh, thanks for the question. 
So basically, um, the palm oil prices are currently under pressure. So it has been dropped, declined until to the 10 months low uh, recently, mainly due to the demand destructions. So um, like, for example, the India, China, and Europe, they are three largest import uh, regions or countries in the world. As because of this COVID-19, uh, they have reduced their imports significantly. Um, as well as the consumption in the countries because of the COVID-19, um, the restaurants, hotel, and caterings all closures in uh, because of the nationwide lockdowns. So this also has affected the consumption of palm oil. So um, for India, for example, their consumption for palm oil has dropped about 40 percent uh, during this period. So. Um, in addition to the, this one, the food sector destruction, there's also uh, some destruction in the biodiesel demand. As you are also aware about, now currently we have the uh, very weak crude oil prices. Uh, this has made the gap between the crude oil and the palm oil become very wide. And then there's not economical uh, to brand the palm oil into the biodiesel. So because of this food destruction in, in the food industry as well as the biodiesel uh, industry, so uh, these are the reasons why the palm oil prices have uh, become so low recently. So uh, that's all for me. Thank you. Great. Brilliant. Um, I think we have our um, analyst, uh, Li Bin Zhou, that wanted to tell us a bit about the monsoon question. Uh, Li Bin, can you hear us now? Hi, Pepe, can you hear me? Yes, brilliant. Uh, how, uh, yes, okay. uh, the, the question's yours. Okay, oh, sorry for that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> no so worries. Yeah, so Indian monsoon, I would say uh, monsoon precipitation is very important for Indian crop production because it amounts uh, over 80% of uh, annual per precipitation in India. So if, uh, uh, if monsoon precipitation is uh, below normal or well below normal, it means uh, uh, the, the reservoir water uh, and the rivers won't be uh, won't have enough uh, water to um, you know um, uh, irrigate the crops in India. Uh, in India, lots of croplands are irrigated, but if uh, there's no enough water uh, to irrigate, then the, the crop production will be affected substantially. Especially the summer crops like uh, uh, rice, soybeans could be affected directly, uh, but for winter crop like uh, um, uh, wheat, wheat, it could also be affected by monsoon precipitation. Uh, like I said, uh, the monsoon precipitation uh, will provide a lot of water for irrigation. Uh, uh, so uh, if uh, uh, it fail, if monsoon precipitation is below normal, then uh, the, the wheat and the uh, wheat seed crops may not be able to get enough water. Uh, so based on our uh, weather team's uh, forecast for India monsoon this summer, uh, India may receive a normal or even above normal monsoon precipitation this year. This is really a good sign for uh, crop production in the coming season, including uh, uh, rice production, soybean production, and uh, the wheat production for for the next season. So. Um, so uh, right now we still don't have uh, the wheat outlook for the next season, but uh, we will produce our first outlook in uh, very likely October. So it's still uh, about half a year uh, to go, but uh, at least uh, the outlook for monsoon precipitation is quite positive for uh, for crop production in India. Got so it. Sounds it. good. Uh, brilliant. Um, and just a reminder from what uh, Rohan said, we will have um, in our weather team presenting a global weather outlook uh, next uh, Wednesday, May 20th. So stay tuned for that one uh, where um, we'll, we'll certainly touch more on um, our expectations around the monsoon and uh, weather and other major ag regions. 
Um, unfortunately, that is all the time we have uh, for today. But again, um, I know there's a few questions we didn't get to. Uh, we'll try our best to um, um, to answer them um, by email. And again, uh, you'll get an email with the uh, presentation when it's ready to go. So uh, thanks, everyone, again. Thanks, Dong. And uh, talk to you soon. Thank you, everyone. Uh, stay healthy.